today, we've got a really fascinating story to tell. It's about one of the um, earliest heroines in the annals of U.S. signals intelligence. To um, help me tell that story, I am delighted to welcome a lady who herself is uh, a very leading person in U.S. cryptology. Uh, Sarah Botsy was the first woman to serve as the NSA representative at the White House Situation Room. Later on, she went back to be the deputy director of the Situation Room, and she is the first NSA female graduate of the U.S. Uh, National War College. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, I'm delighted to say uh, she is also the vice chair of AFI. So, welcome to AFI now. Thank you, Jim, and welcome, David. Uh, our guest today is a, a well-known uh, author, journalist, David Wallman. And he's a uh, sitting out there in uh, paradise on the big island of Hawaii. And uh, we're delighted to have you, and we'll just get started. Um, David is a, uh, an author and a journalist who has written extensively for a number of uh, magazines. He's uh, a speaker of some renown. Um, he's written for Wired, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, National Geographic, Nature, and he was the uh, contributing, he is the contributing editor for the uh, uh, journal Outside. Um, he is a graduate of Middlebury College and has a master's in journalism from Stanford University. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the things he's written about, and I don't want to spend too much time on them because we, we're anxious to hear from him, uh, his most recent book, which won the 2020 Oregon Book Award, was uh, Aloha Rodeo, which uh, talked about three uh, cowboys from Hawaii who went to a rodeo in uh, Rodeo in uh, Cheyenne. Um, they were not expected to win any kind of recognition, but they walked off with the championship. Uh, the, uh, he's, one of his first books was uh, an interesting one uh, with which he has some experience. It was written in 2005, and it was called A Left-Handed Turn, A Left-Hand Turn Around the World. Uh, those of you who have trouble finding uh, left-handed golf clubs and so forth will recognize the trials and tribulations of anybody who's left-handed in this right-handed world. Uh, it probably has a lot of humor in it, uh, as does uh, another book that he wrote in 2008, which is called Writing the Mother Tongue, and that's R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G. Uh, it talks about the evolution of uh, spelling in English, which, as I'm sure you know, just perplexes uh, anybody who's learning English, whether they're um, a native speaker or uh, learning it as a second language. It makes no sense at all, but David has captured some of the <laughs> trials and tribulations of those trying to learn. Uh, another book he wrote is the 2012, The End of Money, and um, that talks about the decline and perhaps disappearance of coins and paper money. Uh, to replace by uh, Bitcoin and other things. I think out of all of this, the first thing that I, uh, I noticed was how varied and eclectic David is as a writer. And uh, so I'd like you to discuss a little bit about how you select your topics. So what, uh, what interests you and, and why do you uh, select these topics? Well, really nice to be with you, by the way, Sally and Jim. Um, you know, I am really, really lucky in that I get to write about the things that interest me. And while it's also true that there have been many things uh, that have interested me that I could not get an editor to bite on, um, this sort of uh, mountain of orphaned ideas that I keep off screen, um, by and large, I'm chasing after topics that, that ignite my curiosity and they are almost a dangerously varied 
Uh, I'm, but what I love about that is there is a sincerity to the, to the pursuit, to the curiosity, um, to the research, you know, I don't come into researching, um, the history of Hawaiian cowboys or signals intelligence or left-handedness feigning this kind of expertise, uh, when I'm interacting with the people who, who I need help from, uh, who I'm interviewing, uh, because it's really the opposite. And, and this does happen a lot in journalism or, uh, writing books. You, 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 you kind of want to impress the people you're talking with, or at least not sound like a moron. And the problem that happens when you start to use more and more of the language of seismology, volcanology, when talking to earthquake scientists is you are drifting away from the reader and the every man and every woman who, who are your, your true, um, allies, obligation, audience, etc. And so, uh, one of the things that's healthy for me as a storyteller and, and bouncing around to different topics is, you know, the last one's not going to write my next one. And here I go completely starting from scratch, knowing nothing about the history of NSA. And now I'm going to dive into this, this story uh, about a legend from the 40s, 50s and 60s. And so that's not a great answer to necessarily why I choose what I choose. I mean, I, I think there's a great story there. I get the feeling it hasn't been told before or told uh, in a exciting way for a mainstream audience. And, and it's something I feel like I could spend a lot of time with and not get really bored. Uh, whereas if someone sent me an idea tomorrow, I, I might get the sneaking suspicion that, you know, after a couple of days of reading, I might tire of that. Um, but with these varied topics, topics that I've been <clears throat> lucky enough to pursue, there really is that sincere curiosity. And I hope I'm, um, I'm sort of letting curiosity sit shotgun and representing kind of the, the interests of my readers when I'm reporting and writing and really try to have my guard up when it comes to trying to look like an expert because I'm not <laughs> to put it, to put it simply. Well, um, your topic, and I'm going to show this, I don't know whether you can see this picture, but this is the uh, subject of your uh, recent Smithsonian article uh, on the in the March um, issue of the Smithsonian. And um, how tell us how you uh, came upon um, uh, discovering Juanita Moody and her story. Sure. This is actually this is a great story. Sometimes um, the Sometimes the genesis story of a project is, is, is either straightforward. You know, I grew up left-handed in a family of righties. What on earth is the story of left-handedness? You know, that's kind of a straight shot. This one is very circuitous and was quite rewarding for me. I was actually in 2015 or 2016, I was following a story lead that brought me to a conference in Japan. Uh, and it was not at all a sure bet, but there was some cloak and daggery kind of things. And someone said, well, maybe, you know, I'm really busy, but if you want to try and catch me in the lobby at this hotel during this conference, maybe we can talk. So I thought, okay, you know, I'm just going to do it. You know, my, my wife thought I was nuts, and but I went. Um, and long story short, that story was a total dead end. But in the van on the way to the conference venue, I met someone who was in the um, uh, intelligence community and there was just a very organic chat about what do you do? Where are you coming from? What do you do? There was maybe four or five people from the conference in the van. And I told him a little about my work and how I'm, I'm not a journalist in the um, spot news sense of it, turning, turning a story quickly for headline news. You know, I, I work at sort of a, <laughs> a glacial pace, turning feature stories in nine or 10 or 15 or months or longer, and really emphasize kind of my interest in narrative stuff. And, and this person just said to me, you know, that 
there's a couple of names I think you should FOIA. And Juanita Moody was one of the, the two names that this person recommended to me. And so I got home from Japan, you know, tail between my legs about the story I was actually looking for and thought, okay, well, I'll just do this FOIA thing because that's not that hard. And as is the case for a lot of independent um, journalists and authors, you have, you're juggling many projects at the same time. And so this Juanita Moody idea kind of came and went, and then I shipped off the FOIA uh, request. And I think it was roughly, uh, don't quote me, quote me on this, but maybe two and a half years later that I received a parcel from DOD that was maybe, um, it wasn't even half an inch thick, um, but it had some heft uh, to it. It certainly had a lot more heft than subsequent <laughs> FOIA replies, which were just uh, rejection, rejection, denial. But um, so I got this parcel. It was about 50 pages of material. And the nature of it was interesting because it was not that informative about her um the, her operations, her career, what exactly she did, or let alone the story story that is the crux of this article, the Cuban Missile Crisis. But there was just enough in it to really get me hooked. Um, and I, first of all, I, I, I am not so seasoned with um, FOIA requests, so I'm sure there was um, an amateur error or, or 10 in my diction in terms of how I was stating the request and therefore what the yield was, which I, I see now a number of years later that I could have, I could have done better in that regard. But um, I, I think I used something along the lines of like career highlights or um, I, I can't even remember the exact words, but I'll tell you the, the bulk of the yield was most, most letters of congratulations and appreciation to her um, in response to this, um, award she had won in the 70s, um, Federal Women's Award, I think is what it was called, but I might be misremembering the name. Anyway, there are a lot of thank yous and war and um, congratulations. And they some, you know, one of them was Kissinger, for example. And you, I could just smell it that there, this woman did some really important things. And is there anybody out there, is there anybody out there in the world who could tell me what on earth she actually did? Um, so it was just enough to get me hooked, and, and that set me on the path of wanting to, to do more research um, on her story. So, so that's where it began. Had you ever uh, had any uh, connection with or uh, uh, correspondence with uh, the intelligence community before? No, I have. You know, I've done some stories that involved um, law enforcement. Um, U.S. Secret Service comes to mind with writing about um, counterfeiters, for example. But this was my my first with the intelligence community. So I was, um, again, just kind of hor horribly green. But as a storyteller, if you play your cards right, that can really work to your advantage. Um, for reasons we could talk about another day, but it makes people very patient with you. It really helps you get to the, the essence of story. Um, and so no, <laughs> I really, I showed up at that symposium where I met you, Sally, a couple of years ago now, um, just looking like I'd um, gotten on the wrong airplane, practically. <laughs> well, in reading this article, um, it, it just seemed to me that uh, somehow you were able to connect with the uh, Center for Cryptologic History and the... Um, the um, oral uh, histories that uh, seem to be part of this story. Is that, is that a, what you were able to, to do? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I would say sort of the three or four main categories uh, in terms of research for this, uh, certainly relatives, friends and family of Juanita um, who can help you, paint a picture of a life outside of work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as all of you intelligence community people know, she did not bring her work home. So if anything, um, to tell you the truth, I, I knew more about her work than 
her family members did after not so many months of research uh, because they just sort of had family lore and, and that was that. Um, on the other hand, sort of coloring in the rest of a life is very important for a story like this. Uh, so the family was um, incredibly helpful and incredibly uh, patient with me. Then, of course, connecting with the NSA historians um, and the museum, uh, Rob Simpson, Dave Hatch, uh, they were just, um, they deserve some kind of Nobel Peace Prize equivalent for dealing with journalists whose emails just keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. Um, and the oral histories that were declassified in, I think, 2016, uh, those were fantastic, right? So Juanita has, there are three interviews with her. Um, that there were many years separating them, which is kind of interesting. There's a change in tenor, I think, between the three. Um, but then what I also was doing was reading a lot of the other ones to try and learn the stories or even look for overlap with Juanita in time and space or um, in a particular situation, especially with the, the Cuba crisis. Um, then there was a lot of other reading as well, but those are that's sort of the... The, the general categories of, of how the research went for this thing. And I assume that you uh, had to um, go back and look at the Bay of Pigs and then uh, trace the evolution in uh, open sources uh, of that development um, culminating in the October 62 um, scare. Right. right. And, you know, the challenge with this this kind of story and, and this one in particular is um, you have to skip like a stone over so many things because you have this, let's say, I don't even know how long this story ended up to be, but maybe 5,000 word limit. Um, so there, there's a borderline criminal uh, over simplicity to, to how you describe the Bay of Pigs um, leading to further tensions, then the Soviets test another nuclear weapon up near the Arctic, and then that, and then suddenly you're right there with Juanita looking over further signals intelligence, indicating this this huge buildup of military equipment uh, on our doorstep, uh, and you know that each one of those little clauses should have been a, a book, if not a whole shelf on a. <laughs> in a library, but you, you can't really do that with a story like this. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm zooming to the, to the activity of our me of our protagonist, uh, as, as best I can, but of course, trying to be, uh, be as accurate as possible. Um, but I specifically remember, remember with writing Bay of Pigs, um, in, in whatever passage I wrote about, I mean, I, I don't even think I gave it a paragraph because you have to get to where the, the hero in the story is actually doing things. And Juanita's not in CIA and she's not Castro and she wasn't on the Bay of Bay. So that's all just quick context before we can get to how, well, what is Juanita doing during all of this? And that's kind of the question I have to keep asking myself to stay focused uh, and not let the thing kind of, get too broad, all of a sudden you're writing a history of the 1960s um, and banging your head against the wall. <laughs> Were there some surprises uh, in doing your research, surprises about the intelligence community? Did you uh, form some uh, new opinions about it, or were you, uh, uh, as so many people seem to be, discouraged about it? What, what were your thoughts on the intelligence community and how it operates? You know, I, um, one of the things I came to really appreciate is actually the thing that is hardest for a storyteller. And that is, um, you know, these are, these are very big organizations with many, many people and the this, this spirit of working on a team and working together. And Juanita and, and so many people like her are not really interested in taking credit and even the historians today talking about people's role back then, there's, there's often kind of a reluctance to put the spotlight on individuals. Uh, and, you know, I have tremendous appreciation for that for, from afar and, and knowing very little about the ins and outs of the intelligence community. But I, I, I would think that 
that everyone should would and should appreciate that kind of lack of ego um, or, or bravado or, or, you know, because some of the, the benefits of working on a team are, are things like checks and balances and um, redundancies and not letting people run away with the wrong information. It just all the things we probably want um, in government or in the intelligence community. The flip side, of course, is stories are about people. Mm -hmm. And so you can't get very far with a source who has said, yeah, you know, I was just doing my job. Mm -hmm. Or the way we work here at NSA is everyone has their role. Everyone carried it out dutifully and no, you know, no one really stood out. When was the last time you had a good book or article about that? Right. And so, um, you know, stories are about people. That doesn't mean people hogging the limelight, but that means people um, doing exceptional things or making difficult decisions under trying circumstances. All the ingredients we all know, but there's kind of an inevitable tension, I think, between um, sort of the, the work, the workplace vibe uh, at, at a CIA or NSA and this need when it comes to stories to showcase the, the, um, the work or challenges faced by individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's, that's one that comes to mind. I think there are a lot of things about um, the intelligence community that, that I learned and came to appreciate. I think uh, as a, I'll just throw in another one as an everyday Joe, um, I had heard about, um, Rivalry, I guess, or a territorial nature between, you know, between the different agencies um, or even kind of siloed uh, operations. <laughs> but with Juanita's story, some of that really came into high def. I really got the sense that, you know, CIA is top dog uh, and uh, other people were using language like, you know, the Ivy League brains uh who, or, or they think they're all the brains those ivy leaguers and everyone else is subservient to them and so i definitely got some of that color i have no idea if any of this applies now uh, i'm not here to uh, um opine about any of that but um there's some nice color about that stuff in the story and in her oral histories uh mm -hmm. and and there's a moment in the story when she in her in her story when she kind of colors outside the lines and sends this report downtown um, against the, the better judgment of some people around her. And she had a friend in CIA who came to kind of both congratulate her or pat her on the back for having done that and simultaneously warn her that people were a little ticked off that she had done that because that really wasn't um, part of an NSA's mandate. Yada, yada, yada. So, you know, th those kind of stories are fun, I think, for outsiders to see um, a little bit of that. Um, it's almost like a sibling rivalry, I, I feel like, between the agencies. Mm -hmm. What are uh, some of the uh, personality uh, characteristics of Juanita that you um, uh, came to um, appreciate uh, during your research? And I, I assume uh, you had never read about her before you took this project on? No, I had never met, I, I learned about her and then was doing some research and for a long time couldn't find a home for, for this story. And I should say, you know, not the story I'd written, the story I wanted to write because you're, you're shopping a pitch. Uh, but then eventually I connected with a terrific editor at Smithsonian who, who believed that, that I could get the goods uh, as far as the research goes. Uh, so I'd never, read about her, known about her previously. Uh, and, and I should add, you know, I hope you share one or two things you remember about her, Sally, also, but because I never met her. Uh, she passed in 2015, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it sounds a little pat, but it, the word certainly jumps to mind first and foremost, which is this sense of perseverance. Uh, you know, she didn't even graduate <clears throat> from college before um, she decided to serve and she is operating in this world of, um, you know, men in all of all of colored uniforms um, for the better part of her career. And so that alone, that sense of kind of being an outsider or um, not belonging and just insisting that she does belong. 
uh, is so admirable to me. Um, I also really get the sense of kind of, um, you know, her, her leadership and managerial skills are, um, were clearly amazing because everyone else is saying so. On the other hand, that's a hard thing to write about without observing it yourself. Mm-hmm. And I guess a different way to say that would be, she does it, it from what I have been reading, she wasn't necessarily the smartest or most brilliant mathematician or code breaker in, in the room. Or let's say she came from the world of linguistics and it, she was a, and, and it was a woman and everyone can just tell that her command of Russian and code breaking in Russian is just head and shoulders above everyone else. So there's this kind of undeniable skill that the men in the room would have to yield to. But with management and leadership, it's kind of this, it's the different sort of skill set. And so I, um, I wish I could have seen her kind of winning the room and winning and earning that authority over so many years um, by wielding that kind of, um, I, I, what, what from, again, from afar, it looks sort of this, this firm leadership capability, but without being this kind of slam your fist on the table personality. Although there is an anecdote or two of her using a hockey stick uh, to bring a meeting to order, which I love. But on balance, I didn't get the sense that she was, um, you know, a, a, a patent like leadership leader. In, um, I'm not sure what the, the best word is at the moment, but she kind of was was a strong leader without necessarily. Um, Shouting, maybe is the word I'm looking for. But you should tell us a little, Sally, because you got to interact with her. Um. Well, I, I would say one of her defining characteristics was impatience. Impatience with uh, plodding along. Uh, impatience when technology didn't uh, uh, cooperate and she would just um, immediately start demanding that things get fixed. And I think that that um, um, brought about a sense of uh, not fear in people, but they knew they had to toe the line and they knew they had to take action. And I think that was her leadership style. I don't think she probably ever went to leadership school, uh, nor did she need to. It was just more her uh, command of the situation and the insistence that things um, be corrected or uh, fixed in a hurry. And uh, so I think it uh, motivated people to move. <laughs> and she did that. You know, she wasn't the most um, diplomatic person sometimes, but I think that was all part of the reason that she was uh, able to succeed because she she did uh, exert uh, a lot of strength that uh, otherwise people uh, wouldn't get uh, wouldn't be able to uh, work with. She is uh, was different from the other two women who were the seniors in NSA at that time. Of course, most people are aware of Ann Cara Christie who. A, a very different kind of leader, but uh, more soft-spoken. And then the one who's never even, um, I don't think she's well-known or has had anything ever written about her that I'm aware of is Polly Budenbach. All three of them came out of the um, Krypton analytic discipline. And uh, so the, the, there were three very early um, successes before the women's movement ever took off in the 70s. And uh, she was a major part of that. Um, she had, uh, the, would you uh, discuss a little bit about what you found out about her interaction with some of the other major players in this whole Cuban Missile Crisis, and I'm, I'm talking about people like Louis, the uh, Dr. Tordella, the uh, NSA Deputy Director at that time, Senators Church and Mondale, um, and uh, Ambassador Stevenson. Uh, give us some context uh, uh, about that. Sure. Uh, and if I misremember anything, you know, just you can always go read the story <laughs> from uh, Smithsonian uh, in March. Um, 
you know, I, I will add, you know, piecing together a story like this, it, it, it feels a little bit like the, what the work of signals intelligence must be like, because there's a lot of this information that's still classified or was redacted and that I, I couldn't get. And so there's an element of kind of triangulating or puzzle solving that just makes me think of her or people in a place like NSA trying to take all this disparate information and, and make a clear picture out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the stakes are much different, obviously, in the intelligence community versus an error in a, a general interest magazine. Um, but I say that because I there's only so much information I could glean about her role during the crisis, which is it's, I'm now absolutely convinced was um, significant, if not pivotal. But there are still um, blind spots in what I no. Um, but one way I like to tell it to people again, outside the intelligence community is that for many months there, we need it. Juanita had a kind of a front row seat to the buildup of military equipment, uh, mm-hmm. in Cuba, mm-hmm. uh, long before the, the two weeks in October that we're, we're focused on. And that I think created this sense of worry or I wouldn't call it dread necessarily, but she knew something was up and a lot of people did, of course, but that's different than being one of the point people for distilling and distributing the information all the time about this. And so I think that had a real effect on her. Then as far as dealing with some of these um, big name personalities, so with Tordello, what happened is she well, first, um, two people from Kennedy's cabinet came to visit her. Uh, mm-hmm. And with Tordella, they went to her office at Fort Meade. And there's all there's even sort of the cloak and daggery moment of turn the blinds, lock the door, tell us everything you know about Cuba. And so she starts this highlight reel of the, the buildup. And they say, whoa, 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 you know, like, how do you know that? Like. Um, I think that they, they were wondering if she was being hyperbolic at one point. And she said, replied, you know, it, I'm not, these aren't hunches. It's all in the SIGINT. And I think that really um, took leadership by surprise that someone had aggregated so much solid information about what was happening uh, and what the Soviets were delivering to Cuba. Of course, not missiles. Can't say that too many times. Of course, not missiles. Nobody knew about the nukes, but um, so Lansdale, who is, um, Kennedy's number two for Latin American affairs or something like that, you can look up his title. He asks her to put together a report, um, summarizing what he has, what she has just told him. She and her team spent a long weekend doing that. Um, they get it to Kennedy. Presumably he read it because it comes back with his initials written in the margin somewhere, I have no idea if he actually read it or how these things go, but that's the that's how it looks um, from the historical record, at least. And then after a few more months, um, Juanita's team, as I understand it, they are updating the material in this report as new information comes in. And Juanita is getting impatient for this report to be distributed um, more widely among the intelligence community or, or downtown um, as you people seem to say a lot. Uh, so Tordella doesn't want to do that. From what I understand, he's very much um, a by the book kind of person. Mm-hmm. And the, the mo- this, this culminates in a moment of tension between them when she says something to the effect of, you know, history is going to show that we're going to be more in trouble for not having distributed this thing than we are if we send it downtown. He relents, they do so, she does, and she is, um, all signs indicate that this was the right decision and she is congratulated for doing so, or at least quietly. Um, Then what happens uh, during the crisis, there's a moment when she has information that she wants to get to Adlai Stevenson, who is presenting at the UN, and State Department people won't put her through and so she just rings his hotel room in Manhattan in the middle of the night 
to get him out of bed and tell him some stuff. And, and, you know, there's the, um, PhD historian version of this, which is what exactly did she say? And we, again, I think we know it's specifically about what's happening in the, in the Atlantic with mm -hmm. Soviet vessels moving or not moving or stopping at the blockade. Mm -hmm. Before getting to that, there's also the, the general interest magazine person element to the story, which is she called the guy at his hotel room in the middle of the night. You know, that is drama. That's a scene. Uh, and that is something where everyday people can really sink their teeth into because she's putting her, putting herself out there in a way that is clearly, um, you know, overstepping, uh, or overstepping in the eyes of some, um, others would use words like maverick or, just doing what's right, um, no matter what, you know, there's all these nice ingredients that, that people keep, keep people engaged in a story and are keen to find out what happens to this person. And so I mentioned all that because I was so delighted to learn about this anecdote of waking Adelaide Stevenson in, in the middle of the night in his hotel room, because you can just see her in action, you know, and she's got, God damn it. I'm just going to get on the phone and call the guy. And that's, an, that's <laughs> a um, and then the story with Mondale, I think, is uh, is very interesting. Yes. Yeah, so with with the church committee hearings, um, and I think if if there are any other writers or historians out there uh, watching um, our discussion, I'm I'm very interested to know about the decision-making process within NSA for deciding who went to testify. Because I don't understand why they sent her. And there, to, a, to an outsider, uh, there's a real kind of throw her under the bus vibe to what's happening there. And why, why, didn't, the, why didn't leadership go to it? And you know, some did, but this certainly wasn't part of her background or her training. Mm -hmm. But she was... Um, a good soldier sort of through and through and her boss asked her to go do this thing. And so she went to do it. Uh, she clearly was uncomfortable, but uh, at the same time, she clearly manhandled the um, <laughs> interviewers uh, and really put people in their place. And there's a nice, um, in the oral history, she describes interaction with Mondale, who is really, um, oh, I don't want to, Grandstanding might be the word. Um, you know, people are really upset about what what was happening or what they perceived was happening uh, with with surveillance. And he was laying into her, but it was also clear that he really had no grasp of the technology at play. And I I won't be able to summarize the exchange precisely here, but the the. 25 words or less is that he said, you know, bring me everything you've got, you know, any recordings of, of Americans that you've gathered, I, we want it. We, and he was really asking for something that was somewhere between impossible and asinine, but she just said, okay. And so then used a dump truck to deliver this mountain of paper to the, the sidewalk, I guess, out front of his office the following day saying, you asked for it, you know, here's everything we've got. Uh, and it's, it's illustrative, of course, of who she was, but also of, um, I think in the more serious terms, kind of the, the, the asymmetry of knowledge about how NSA uh, worked and how, and government, and, and, government and the public's perception of what NSA was doing. Um, so that, you know, and that was a pretty terrible um, first date, I would call it between the public and NSA, because up until that time, most people just didn't, didn't even know it existed. And so that, that couldn't have really gone worse. Um, and again, Juanita, you know, I think she did, by all accounts, she did well, but I also think it was pretty unfair of them to send her, because the only times that her name was really in the public eye was during this um, very controversial moment. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, Senator Mondale would not have been the first person to ask for everything you've got, quote. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's happened 
a number of times ever since, so <laughs> it's not unusual. <laughs> um, you mentioned the Smithsonian, and I noticed that um, they have been featuring some articles about uh, women, including the first uh, F-35 Eagle pilot, and uh, I guess this um, story fit in with that uh, um, move to recognize some of the early uh, pioneers of uh, and and the later ones uh, uh, in women's history. Well, I think you know I can't speak for the magazine because I'm a, a lowly freelancer, but. Um, I, part of it, I think is women's history month. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, people's, all people's uh, eagerness now to kind of correct the historical record and find some of these, more of these stories of so-called hidden figures who were, um, overlooked because history has been so often written by white men. Mm -hmm. And, so I think some of that is at play, I think. Um, and that's not just on the editorial side. I think writers, you know, myself included, are, are hungry for those kind of stories, too, because they make you rethink what you think you know about the world or who was doing what. Uh, and I'll give you a, a, another example. Com seems completely out of left field, but it's um, it's on point, which is that by some estimates, 25 percent of the cowboys of the American West were African-American. And that was a, a, a number that I learned while researching the story of Hawaiian cowboys, right? And it just completely makes you rethink what you think you know, because what you think you know is um, oversimplified, A, and B, you know, probably shaped by some John Wayne movies. And that's not, that's not the whole story. And so there is, I think, um, or I hope, a kind of collective eagerness to to find and showcase more stories like this, more stories of women, um, you know, in pivotal roles in history that have thus far been um, overlooked or largely overlooked or sidelined. Um, yeah. And the only other thing I'll add about Smithsonian is it's kind of a sweet spot for them, right? I mean, it's the intersection of um, technology and American history and the Cold War, so, you know, if, if that editor had said no to me, I think I would have just fallen on my sword and said, I, I just can't figure out how to do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did an excellent job, David, and we're uh, very grateful that you've been able to spend some time with us today and uh, tell the story of this story. And uh, we look forward to, uh, in fact, I'm going to uh, order your books and read some of those uh, stories about left-handedness and uh, and the English language. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'll now turn it back over to Jim. The article is called uh, Cuba Confidential. It appears in the March edition of the Smithsonian Magazine. And it is the story of the life and accomplishments of Juanita Moody, very well told by uh, David Wallman. I'd like to thank David and Sally for what has been a fascinating program. Thank you both very much. <laughs>